get the book entitled The Dulcy Book. The Dulcy Book. It's creepy, but if you read it, it will tell the truth. It's the Andropleiadian Reptilian Conspiracy. Dr. J. Vernon McGee, many years ago in his book, Through the Bible, and I'm quoting him, is one of the greatest evangelists that's ever lived, one of the greatest pastors that ever lived, loved by, he's a pastor's pastor. He said, and I quote in his book, Through the Bible, volume 1, page 13, quote, I believe that Genesis is telling us that this earth became without form and void, that it was just as uninhabitable as the moon when the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We can only suggest that there was some pre-Adamic creature that was on the earth. And it seems that all of this is connected with the fall of Lucifer. This is J. Vernon McGee, folks. He goes on to say, quote, I believe that the entire universe came under this great catastrophe. What was the catastrophe? We can only suggest that there was some pre-Adamic creature that was on this earth. And it seems that all of this is connected to the fall of Lucifer, son of the morning, who became Satan, the devil, as we know him today. I think all of this is involved here in Genesis 1, verse 2. But God has not given us all details. The fact of the matter is that he has given us very, very few details in the first chapter of Genesis. Wow. Some of the concepts we're going to touch on tonight include, praise Jesus. I love this. I love the mysteries of the Bible. It's so exciting. Our Heavenly Father rocks. He's awesome. Praise you, Father God. Thank you for this opportunity. Praise you, Jesus. Predestination is not only real, it's real cool. It's awesome. Jeremiah 1.5 Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. Wow, that's powerful. Before you were born, you were sanctified. Wow, I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. That's speaking to Jeremiah. Incarnation is real, but reincarnation is a lie. Wow, check that out. Matthew seventeen ten through 13. Disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has already come. <laughs> Kenneth, will you jump in there for me? How does that work? Well, you know what? That's one of those things, John, <laughs> that I struggle with. I call that, and I do, I have a word for it. I, I call it, I, other people probably use it, I just call it Mysterion. And that that right there, <laughs> I'm not even going to touch that one, brother. And there, there are scriptures like this all over the Bible, and and the normal theologians out there just blow right past it. I mean, you can't even ask the average church pastor a question about that. He'll look at you like a dog with that, that's lost its ball. Like, you know, it's just amazing. And and uh, praise God, we're going to tackle that tonight. Listen to this, Ephesians one three through four. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. How exciting. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. John 10. John 10, 34. This is one of my favorite ones. John 10, 34. And Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, Ye are gods. Oh, by the way, that's a little G, folks. That's a little G. Why would Jesus say that? Well, we're going to tell you why. It's pretty exciting. So, me too. Who could this be talking about? Let's listen to this. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges amongst the gods. That's a little G, by the way. This is why this is why the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not have any other god before me. He's not talking about little golden statues, folks. Ah, uh, no. That's a big no. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges amongst the gods. 
How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked, Salah? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are unstable. Because of you, gods. I said, you are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men. Guess who that's talking about, folks? Yup. You and me. Praise Jesus. The Cathars knew about it. The Cathars were killed by the Roman Catholic Inquisition. Have been forbid that the Catholic, the Roman Catholics, who were ultimately the most Luciferian operate. I mean, come on, folks. I mean, police. That's a whole. There's volumes. There's entire libraries. Never mind, the Vatican Library has been shut down because they know we're on to them and they don't want us coming in and finding the books that they stole with their Knights Templar from Solomon's Temple and all that other stuff. But never. But listen to this. They murdered the, Albi, uh, the, the Al- Al- Albigensians or whatever, um, and the Walden, Waldensians, the Cathars. They called them the Cathars, but they were actually known. The Cathars were known to the people in southern France as the good Christians. That's what they were known by. They were given the title of the Cathars by the Inquisition as they were being slaughtered, men, women, and children. One of the reasons they were slaughtered is because they had a, rit- a rite. Well, they called it the, the inquisitors called it a rite that they disapproved of. It was called giving people the baptism of the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands. They called it a rite. It's fascinating to note that even in Wikipedia, it clearly says, and this is a read right from the right from the Wikipedia. It says the human condition. This is re, in regard to the Cathars who were slaughtered, slaughtered by the Roman Catholic Inquisition. There can make a spark of divine light. This light or spirit had fallen into captivity. Did you hear that? Fallen into captivity within a realm of corruption identified with the physical body and the world. You see, they were labeled by the Roman Catholics as heretics. Have you ever asked yourself, did you you remember what I just read at the beginning of the show? Praise God. That... It's it, the information is in the pseudo epigrapha. It's in the apocrypha. It's in the books that the Gnostics were burnt at the stake for having in their Bible. Kenneth, who was it? Uh, what were the some of the books that they had? It was the uh, oh gosh, the Ethiopian Bible, I believe you said. Yes, the Ethiopian had the books of Enoch, and so did the Serbian Bible. And if you want a really good history on on what John just talked about with regard to this persecution, I'm going to uh, put a link up right now. It's called. A Lamp in the Dark, The Untold History of the Bible. This goes through and shows all of these persecutions of these people. They got it. You'll see how the Valdanese, the Cathars, all these different groups who carried this truth throughout the ages were persecuted. So, yeah, yeah, they, they didn't get the word from Rome, John, to take it out. They knew. The apostles knew. Everything we're going to talk about tonight, I am... Very certain in my heart that the apostles knew all this stuff, because a lot of the scriptures that Brandon has in his book from the pseudo epigrapha are have matching scriptures in the current 66 book canon that nobody can tell you what they mean, or they can take a wild guess. But Zen's got it figured out. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for Brother Zen. Okay, so here's a summary of events that we're going to discuss. Luciferian Rebellion happened arguably millions of years ago. There was a rebellion that included the angels who sided with Lucifer. Now, Zen's going to clear a lot of this stuff up for you. I'm going to let you know in advance that if you want to get a primer, it's just a primer, and we do not agree 100% with any of this information. You need to be your own Brian, Acts 17.11, and search the scriptures daily to see if it were so. The Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they studied the Bible and double-checked all the math. We recommend, don't believe a word we say. Get your Bible out. 
Okay. If you want to find out more information about the Luciferian Rebellion, you can go to Professor Luginbill, search on L-U-G-I-N-B-I-L-L, at itchiest.com. It's hard to spell, but anyway, just search on the Satanic Rebellion, Professor Luganbill. It's awesome work. And thank you, Lauren, for that. God bless you. I know you're listening. Praise Jesus. Also, you can find a lot of this information by uh, uh, looking at the Lightworkers link and reading the Angel Wars and the Fallen Cre- or the Angel Wars and the Original Sin article on Tribulation Now. Um, some of the fundamentals of what we're going to discuss, you can also get your hands on by searching on the Luciferian Codes by Ken Klein. We don't agree 100% with everything that Ken thinks, but that's fine. It's got a lot of good information in it. And also you can get his DVD called Angel Wars and the Fallen Creators, which we have a lot of questions for Zen about. Okay, We're going to define what a son of God is. Lucifer was the first created son of God. Any entity, any being that was created by God directly to work on behalf of the heavenly office of God is by definition a son of God. That includes all the different classes of angels, the creator gods, the Elohim, all of that. They're all sons of God. And so are we. Isn't that cool? Have I not said ye are God, said Jesus Christ in John 10.34? Right on! Very cool. The Morning Star Office. Lucifer was temporarily, temporarily placed in charge of the Morning Star Office and started to play God. And that kicked off the Angel Wars. There was a ruling in the Supreme Court of the Heavenly Office. God has a court. It's like a court. It's like a Supreme Court. There are judgments. You just look. type the word judge with a star, and angel. And you will see that angels will do judge, judging or judgment activities on behalf of the heavenly office of God. It's in the 66 uh, book canon. Praise God. It's all there. Um, so praise Jesus. We're, we're going to cover We're going to cover the cup of forgetfulness, the fact that we had to drink from the cup of forgetfulness in order to redeem ourselves. We're redeeming ourselves. Isn't that a fascinating word? I don't want to redeem myself because... A woman 6,000 years ago ate a piece of fruit. Do you? Hmm. This is exciting. Praise Jesus. All right. We're going to talk about uh, the, all these things, and we're going to bring on Brother Zen. Uh, God bless you, brother. So glad to have you on here tonight. We still got almost a full two hours to discuss all this stuff. Um, praise Jesus for you. You there? I am. It's always a pleasure, always an honor. Uh, it's good being with you guys. Hey, Zen. Nice to hey, you. brother. Yeah, amen. Hey, um, so, uh, gosh, we have a lot of stuff here to talk about. And when I was looking at the draft uh, information that you had sent me, the the, the um, excerpts and such from your forthcoming book, so what is the schedule? Uh, is there an update on the schedule of the Sons of God, Who Are We and Why Are We Here book? Yeah, um, it's my sixth coming book. My fourth book was The Lucifer, Father of Cain. Um, this book, I just received the the recent latest copy edit from um, my publisher. So all I have to do is revise some of what they sent me that's in green. And uh, I'll be done with my part. And then it'll be just a matter of them finishing up the process. And it should definitely be out by November this year. So, <clears throat> Okay, praise Jesus. Well... <laughs> And so we're pretty anxious. I, I tell you what, folks. Um, you know, I've seen some of the excerpts from the book, and it's very, very exciting. And we're going to share with you some of that tonight. So, um, so some uh, introductory statements. Why is Jesus referred to? These are some of the things that's going to help us understand. Why is Jesus referred to as the first Adam? Okay, that's a mystery that's in the sixty-six book canon that no pastor I've ever met in my thirty-plus years of being a Pentecostal Assembly of God type of guy. Nobody knows. Why is Jesus referred to as the first Adam? And Zen's going to help us understand that. Why is John the Baptist referred to as the spirit of Elijah? We're going to find out about that. Why does Jesus say in 1034, have I not said John, 1034, have I not said you are gods? Why is the New Age movement so popular? Reincarnation, past lives, the Galactic Federation of Life. Why does it ring true to so many millions of people? Who might the benevolent be? of aliens out there be. So if you study alien abductions, testimony from tens of thousands of people, arguably, that have been abducted by aliens, and they testify consistently across the world, there are benevolent species of aliens out there. Who might 
they be. And that's in Brother Ben's book. We're very excited about that. Praise God. Uh, what's all about? What's Psalms 82 about? And and also um, we're going to ask Brother Zen to expound a little bit and well in great detail about Genesis one, uh, arguably the fallen creator gods that uh, are referred to by Ken Klein's operation and kind of give us the details there. So um, can you start out Zen? There one of the things from reading your book that I think the listeners need to get their arms around. And I think your book said that very clearly, that the reader has to get their arms around this this particular concept in order to grasp, you know, everything else. And that was the first world age and the second world age. And and ultimately, I don't don't even understand what the third world age is. Um, But without getting detracted on that, can you talk to people about what was... What was the first world age, and then what was the second world age, and how does that play into getting our arms around the Luciferian fall, the angel wars, and uh, and and the first Adam and the second Adam? I think this is a a perfect question to kind of set the foundation for this teaching, and it it takes quite a bit just to set the premise because <clears throat> excuse me. Um, because most people are not aware of this. And this is something, like he said, um, this is a revelation that the Lord gave to me that I've not seen anybody else talk about as well. And so, yeah, we're going to tie together the three atoms and the three world ages. And I'm going to begin with a quote. This quote from On the Origin of the World, which is from the Nag Hammadi Codices, which are uh, a group of texts that were found in 1946, right before Israel became a nation, and it's also um, before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. That was a whole other set uh, and collection. And the quote says this, Now the first Adam, Adam of light, is spirit endowed and appeared on the first day. The second Adam is soul endowed and appeared on the sixth day, which is called Aphrodite. The third Adam is a creature of the earth, that is, the man of the law, and he appeared on the eighth day, the tranquility of poverty, which is called the day of the sun or Sunday. The progeny of the earthly Adam became numerous and was completed and produced within itself every kind of scientific information of the soul-endowed Adam, but all were in ignorance. Now, to set the premise for the three world ages, i got to have to explain the three atoms first. The first Adam, Adam of light. This is our Lord. This is the Son, the only begotten that was brought forth as the light of creation, and I explained this to you, John. We we sat on, uh, we talked on the phone a little bit about this, and I want to make this clear to you as well because this is something that happened twice. Adam of light. When the Lord said, "Let there be light," and light and darkness were separated after the first day, when the unseen worlds, the imperishable worlds, were separated from the visible, the lower, the fallen worlds. Uh, This is when the Lord took his dominion over creation. This is also the moment when all of creation came into visibility. It talks about in Job that there was a moment when all the angels shouted for joy because at at the revealing of the morning star. Okay, wait, wait, wait. wait. Let me me jump in. I, I need to ask a question. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. So, is this would this be related to the mysterious verse of John one where it says, "In the beginning was the Word, and the Word exactly. was with God." Uh, so, yeah. so, and the Word was God. So the Word yeah. was God, and and in the beginning was God. And and okay, so can you? And it even goes on. And it says, "And the life was the light of men, and right. the light shines in the darkness. The darkness did not comprehend it." So right there is a group of scriptures in the beginning of John. That so, so Jesus. What you're saying is, 
Jesus, Yahushua, Savior, Messiah, as you put it, yes. uh, uh, became the light of the entire creation and universe and revealed the glory of God to even the sons of God that had been created prior to the manifestation of Yahushua in, exactly. in the heavens. Wow. Exactly. And wow. you're right. John chapter 1 is the summation of all of what I'm talking about here. And this is also why, because it was on the, on the uh, when light and darkness were separated, it says in the book of Enoch on the second day, that Lucifer was kicked out of the heavens. And in Luke, it talks about the Lord says, I saw Satan fall as lightning from the heavens. And this was that particular moment. Because when the Lord came, when the Father revealed the Son, he in the voice, let there be light, the glory of the Lord was revealed. His only begotten Son, Yahushua, Savior, Messiah, was crowned in glory, given dominion. Because everybody knew he was, you know, he had dominion. He was the light of the universe. And and so they all knew that the father that had brought him forth was their creator and that this was the son who was given dominion and was also the visible embodiment and the physical verbal expression, the word of the father. And so the, the father is all things and Christ also is all things. But Christ oh, so more... Is that- is that, the, is that the explanation of Colossians one sixteen? It says, this has also always been a mystery to a lot of... It says, Colossians one sixteen. it says, For by him all things were created yeah. that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, mm-hmm. dominions, principalities, and powers. So basically, to get this straight, Yahushua, Savior, Messiah, Jesus Christ, is ultimately the makeup of all the particles of the universe. He is the energy that reveals the creation to all of the entities that can even perceive creation. Right. He is all of creation. The unseen and the seen. He he is the consciousness, the spirit, the love, the energy that is that, that makes all things possible. So his manifestation in the flesh as a as is you know in our image was ultimately so that we could relate to him exactly wow exactly and that was his way of redeeming us through the flesh as well right okay do you want me to continue yes, with the yes, second please. and third all right okay so the second adam from the quote it says the second adam is soul endowed and appeared on the sixth day now we know this adam as the adam of genesis 3 the one that was created by Yahweh Elohim, given the spirit, the breath of life. He was elevated and created and protected and put into paradise, which is a different place than where we are now on this particular planet, on this earth. Paradise is at the third heaven. And so when Adam was taken up into paradise, he was created much like the other angels as a hermaphroditic being. He was both male and female gendered at that particular time, like the other angels. And then when Eve was split off from him, it was then that female and male genders came into being. And it was through Eve that Satan was going to cause his temptation. And remember I told you, um, there's a book, The Vitae, The Life of Adam and Eve. It's a Latin book. And in that book, Adam and Eve are already banished, kicked out of paradise, placed on the earth, and they're asking Satan why it is that he's persecuting them so. Because they have no idea who he is. Uh, and it's not... Um, and so they they question him. And in the text, he says that it's because of Yahushua, the first Adam, and his being banished out of the heavens, kicked out of the heavens, and being stripped of his glory and of his bright nature, that he is taking revenge against Adam and Eve. Okay, so if Adam and Eve were created in a paradise, as 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 the, the this goes, okay, so in the second, or I'm sorry, in the first world age, uh, before the fall, they were in 
ultimately in paradise and um you know then and and Adam and Eve were ultimately the master plan was that they were going to be the if you will the founding of the bloodline that the fallen uh ones the fallen we'll just call them the fallen ones that's you and me right. and, and all the human race that's that's going through this redemption process okay yeah. so 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 that implies that when Adam and Eve were originally created in paradise that the father knew in advance that he was going to because uh, there were the fall had already happened, right? Yes. Yes. So how the did that fall work? had already happened, and okay. both he knew that Satan would fall and would lead a rebellion, and that one third of the angels would rebel with them. And he also knew that when he created Adam and Eve as a special creature that they also would fall. It, it talks about this oh. in the first book of Adam and Eve because all of this had to take place in order for us to incarnate into the flesh because it's through the flesh that the redemption process takes place. And it's also through the flesh that the Lord would come in and glorify himself and exalt himself and show to us by example that he is the arbiter, that he holds the key to the everlasting life and salvation and the eternal kingdom, and that okay. he can give it to whomever he wishes. Okay, so that's in essence why it says in Psalms 82, I said you are gods, you are children of the yeah. Most High, but you shall die like men. So that's actually the judgment upon us, right? Right, yes. Wow, wow. And and the Lord and knew them, that when he created... Well. And the Lord knew that when he created Adam and Eve exactly. in paradise, knowing right. in advance that they would eventually fall. Right, and that they would be tempted. because, um, And that is when the second world age began. We're talking about the three world ages. The first world age is the spiritual world age. It's that age where we were part of that war in heaven. We were in whatever, whatever it is, whatever capacity it was, whether we served on the the side of uh, Lucifer and the seraphim angels or Michael and the cherubim or Gabriel and the opening, whatever it was, we find ourselves in flesh now. So we are also part of the fallen and going through the redemption process. And so this, this second world age, this earth is the proving ground. Here we incarnate with both good and bad angels. Uh, and we have the temptation of good and evil, the knowledge of both, the duality of both, and and that will be with us until we succumb to death. And you were asking about the third world age. Well, I, let me explain real quick the third Adam, because this is important, and this is something that I emphasize in my book, because this is also something that most people have never heard about and never talk about. The third Adam is a creature of the earth, that is, the man of the law. He appeared on the eighth day. This is so very important for people to understand. Adam of paradise was created on the sixth day. Eve was separated from him on the sixth day. They were tempted and fell. There was a day of rest, the seventh day, the day of the law. The Lord allowed a reprieve. On the eighth day, Adam and Eve were pushed from paradise, transformed into the flesh to where they had flesh bodies, that the same bodies that they would then fulfill all the prophecies as laid out in Genesis chapter 3, that it would be on the eighth day and on the wilderness of the earth in a place called the Cave of Treasures. This is, would be their first residence on this planet. And it was in the Cave of Treasures that they found themselves in flesh bodies, and it would be in these flesh bodies that the prophecies would be filled. Namely, that Eve would be seduced by the archons, impregnated with the firstborn son of Lucifer, whom we know as Cain. And it would also be here that Adam would have to till the soil, work the garden, and bring forth sustenance to feed what would be this progeny. He was going to have children. They were now flesh beings. They were in a different place, and it would be here that the second world age would play out. And okay, this, well, quick question for you. 
Um, the Cain thing, the Cain thing. So what you're saying is Cain was basically a fraternal twin? No, no, no. Okay. Um, see, here's what happened, and I explained this also because this story comes from not the Nakamati Codices. All right, what happened is on the eighth day, Adam and Eve, they find themselves surrounded by devils and demons. They're here on this planet. They realize that the fallen ones that are around them are not their creators. They know that this is not God. This is not Yahweh Elohim. They know that they have been kicked out of paradise and they are fall in a fallen state and that they are surrounded by devils and demons. And so having that recognition and that awareness, it talks about in the Nakamani Codices how the Lord came to Adam and Eve and ex- Explained to them their fallen state, and he exalted them. He had them actually eat from what was called the tree of the good. And it was when they ate of this other fruit that their eyes were open. They realized that those fallen devils and demons around them were definitely not their gods, not their creators, and that they were in you know in a fallen state, in a fallen world and that they would have to serve out this lifetime and in these flesh bodies uh, until the Lord came to redeem them and took them again, and that their progeny would also have to undergo the experience of life and duality in order to prove themselves. And we we are the children of that. We are the progeny, and we are the fallen ones that are now incarnating in the flesh to prove ourselves. But this is also approving grounds for the fallen angels because they are also convicting themselves in their capacity to do evil, in their leading humanity astray, in their trying to exalt themselves to be as the Creator and to receive the worship of the Most High and the Morning Star administration. They also are going to be judged for these. And there are many good angels with us that are working on behalf of Yahweh Elohim and the Morning Star Administration. And if it weren't for them, we would really be in a terrible, terrible state because it's only by their restraining hand that evil is just not as rampant. You know, John, you were talking about these stories about these people eating individuals. I covered this in a show that I did this past Saturday. I'm also doing a show with William Kennedy on this this upcoming Saturday. But basically, these people are putting bath salts into their drug supply, into their heroin, into their cocaine, their methamphetamine, to increase the supply. And this drug is opening these people up to full demonic possession. And it's these particular individuals that are having this demonic possession being expressed through them and that's why we're having the abundance of this insanity happening around us and the Lord said that this would happen I don't I don't know if you're aware I'll just read this real quick and then I'll um, let you comment but from Micah chapter 3 there's a verse in there that talks about these this kind of behavior it says this and I said here I pray you O heads of Jacob And ye princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment, who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them, and they break their bones and they chop them in pieces as for the pot and as flesh within the cauldron. And then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doing. So this kind of behavior is nothing. This is something that the elite have been doing in ritual basis for many generations, hundreds of years. Oh, yeah, amen. As a matter of fact, we've covered, uh, and you have as well, um, you know, uh, for example, Second Corinthians eleven fourteen says, "For Satan <clears throat> transforms himself into an angel of light," and that's also confirmed um, in some of the uh, apocryphal 
pseudoepigraphy, almost repeated to the to a T. And then um, for they changed themselves into the men in the testament of Reuben. And then in the book of Jubilees it says, for in those days the angels of the Lord descended upon the earth, those who are named the watchers. And then uh, in the testament of Amran, I saw the watchers in my vision. I asked them, who, you, what are you? They answered and said, we have been made masters and rule over the sons of men. I raised my eyes and saw one of them. His looks were frightening, like those of a viper. And then the Sahih Hadith says, Snakes are the forms of the transmutations of the shape of the jinn. And then the emerald tablets of Thoth, which you have done uh, specials on, in the form of man moved they amongst us, but only to sight. Were they as our men? serpent-headed when the glamour was lifted, but appearing to man as men amongst men. So there you have uh, several scriptures from the Apocrypha Pseudo-Epigrapha and also some other ancient writings that uh, strongly supports what we already know is a fact, which is we're, we have shapeshifters, uh, reptilian entities living amongst us. The Nakash, that's N-A-C-H-A-S-H, from Genesis 3, the two-legged serpent creatures. So uh, we live in a very heavily infested, you know, this is alien demon infested world is putting it lightly. Yeah, absolutely. Ephesians 6, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, powers, principalities, the rulers of darkness out of this world. You know, people are still, still can't wrap their minds around the reality of what it is we're dealing with and the supernatural nature of it. And, uh, and when you know when things are happening and the skies are filled and all kind of uh, demonic stuff like what is happening with people getting their faces eaten off, when these kind of weird spiritual manifestations begin to occur on a daily basis and people just have no idea where to turn or what to do, and you know what do the what do the police the police are flipping out right now, they have right. no idea what to do with all these cannibal cases. And it's not being reported. No, as a matter of fact, and, and as with satanic ritual abuse cases, the vast majority of them will never make the press. So it's probably a ten to one ratio. We're we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Um, praise God. So tell me, tell the folks about. Okay, so you were going to say that basically that that Eve was seduced. Was she drugged? How did that work again? All right. Well, there are several stories. Um, and you know, all I can tell you is based on the stories, and, and you know, we can only introspect. But from the Colburn Bible, there's one story of that Eve was at a, a moon ritual, and that there was a particular concoction that was created, and that she shared this concoction with uh, with Adam, and that it was while they were passed out, while they're they were, you know, intoxicated and away from their bodies because of the uh, stupor and the effect of this particular drug that both of them were raped and that um uh, by these spiritual forces and it was that at that point that Eve became impregnated with Cain who, you know, we know as the firstborn son of the devil or Samuel it says in the in the Targums but um yeah, so, and there's also other texts, like the Nag Hammadi Codices talk about her eating from the tree of good and having, um, and both of them being awakened. Now, whether there's some kind of, you know, some people might say that this was a, a hallucinogenic drug or some kind of, I don't, I don't know what it was. All I know is that this particular, Whatever it was, this fruit, they understood that they were in a fallen state and that they were living. And it doesn't even have to be anything because we know that the Lord can, in the instant, in a moment, pour wisdom and knowing and instant knowledge upon anybody and fill them with, with you know, the secrets and the mysteries of the universe if he so wishes. So it doesn't matter what it was. All we know is that Yes, Adam and Eve realized that they were in a fallen state, that, and it was in this flesh state after the eighth day what, that their bodies were transformed into flesh. And if you want to read more about this, you can go to the the Forgotten Books 
of the Bible, the Forbidden Books of Eden, um, the first book of Adam and Eve, and the second book of Adam and Eve, and they talk about how how strange it was for them even to walk, and how they didn't even understand how to walk and and how to move in in a physical way, and they refused to eat and did not want to eat or drink anything for the longest time because they knew once they did that their they were essentially lost to their bright natures and that they would be in these flesh bodies and that they would be in this animal nature. Uh, it also talks about how they were unacquainted with the experience of uh, heat from the sun, uh, darkness from the 12 hours of night and 12 hours of day because there was a, a perpetual cycle. There was no uh, tilt to the earth at that time. Everything was in uh, perpetual harmony. Um and so all of these things were totally unfamiliar to them because they were in a bright nature. And they also talk about and lament the loss of that bright nature because in, in their original first estate way of being, they were like the angels. They were, um, they were you know, like the angels and they had spiritual bodies they had bright nature they were clothed in light uh, they were not fleshly beings but it was after the fall and after the deception after the temptation after the impregnation of eve with this other bloodline um that uh that all of this then unfolded now right. and as now, far as the real, real quick Real quick, I just want to interject here. <clears throat> Folks, a 6.6 .6 magnitude earthquake just struck the Panama Pacific coast. That's just uh, that's just south of, uh, uh, down. well, you know, hopefully you know where Panama is in Central America. So, folks, a 6.6 .6 magnitude earthquake just struck the Panama Pacific coast. Okay, so stay tuned and keep keep your eyes on that. We know we're facing an imminent west coast North America mega quake. Okay, so stay tuned. Praise Jesus. Keep your heads down and pray hard. Hallelujah. All right. Sorry to interrupt, brother. Go on. Okay, I just want to address this point because you asked about whether they were fraternal twins or not. And I'm going to tell you there's two accounts to the story. First, there there's the biblical account where, yes, it says, you know, that first um, Eve was seduced by Samuel, impregnated with Cain, and then Abel, uh, later she also had sex with her husband, Adam, and that Abel was um, a later twin. That's one of the stories. Then there's also another story that Cain was actually um, birthed with a twin sister, and that Abel was later birthed with his own twin sister, and that when Adam and Eve wanted to marry off Cain's sister, to Abel that he became jealous. And and this talks about this, I think, in, in the book of Jabber, Jasher or the book of Jubilees. It's one of those um, those texts. And it also, it covers how they also argued about eternal life. And, and Abel kept telling uh, Cain that there was judgment and there was righteousness and that there was rewards for the righteous. And Cain was a denier of eternal life, and he was a denier of, you know, consequence, that there would be consequence for actions. Okay, so, so would that be linked to 1 John three twelve, where it says, uh, where there's this kind of mysterious comment where one of the apostles basically says, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that right. we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. I just think it's just fascinating that thousands of years later, this particular, you know, in 1 John 3, uh, chapter, or verse 11, it, you know, they, they pull out and they say, they use Cain as like the the the, the foundation of evil uh, in, the, in the earth, which I find amazing. Uh, and it even implies that he was of the wicked one. It says it's that specifically in the King James and the New King James. Yeah, how people can disconnect that from him being the child and the progeny of Lucifer is just beyond me, but many people still do. So, 
Can you talk can you talk to folks about the so what happened with the Luciferian rebellion? I mean don't you know you know in other sure. words you, you would discuss like is that is that all linked back because here's the thing folks the Luciferian rebellion and this is what you know the angel wars ultimately is part of the Luciferian rebellion and or you can call it the Satanic rebellion if you want to if you want to start on Lugan bills were out there or also Custance uh if you go to custance.org c u s t a n c e.org you can find some great work there um but anyway so you got the angel wars and then and that ultimately ended up in a judgment on the angels, and some of the angels uh, agreed, arguably us, you can call them sons of God if you want, if you don't want to split hairs over what type of sons of God they were, because we're sons of God now, we're fallen sons of God, redeeming ourselves, praise God. All right, that's all over the 60s of a canon, that's undeniable. Now, so there was a war in the heavens, angel wars, and then that explains, you know, our being injected, or incarnated at, at 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 conception in the womb, that explains Jeremiah one five. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. So that's predestination in at work. Okay. So um, talk to us a little bit about you know the, what, what how did it? I mean, it's like tied into the T Mott Van Allen belt, Mars being destroyed, alien spacecraft, Vimana nuclear weapons, the Dr. Joseph Farrell cosmic war concept. Is that what this is kind of all about? Was this a big war in the heavens with technologies and and planets being blown up and that kind of thing? Yes. In fact, wow. uh, in fact, the Earth used to be a, a different planet. Uh, this planet used to be called Tiamat, and it used to be located where the asteroid belt is now. And I talk about that in my book as well, because that is ta- that is part of the the war in heaven, the the war between the dragon uh, and the Lord of Hosts. Uh, let's look at a let's look at a quote here. A introspection from the first book of Adam and Eve, chapter fifty five, says this. But now, O Adam, we will make known to you what came over us through him before his fall from heaven. He gathered together his hosts and deceived them, promising to give them a great kingdom, a divine nature, and other promises he made them. His hosts believed them that his word was true. And so they yielded to him and renounced the glory of God. And he then sent for us, according to the orders in which we were, to come under his command and to accept his vain promise. But we would not, and we did not take his advice. And then after he had fought with God and had dealt forwardly with him, He gathered together his hosts and made war with us. And if it had not been for God's strength that was with us, we could not have prevailed against him to hurl him from heaven. But when he fell from amongst us, there was great joy in heaven because of his going down from us. For if he had remained in heaven... Nothing, not even one angel would have remained in it. But God, in his mercy, drove him from amongst us to this dark earth, for he had become darkness itself and a worker of unrighteousness. And he has continued, O Adam, to make war against you, until he tricked you and made you come out of the garden to this strange land where all these trials have come to you. And death, which God brought to him, he has also brought to you, O Adam, because you obeyed him and trespassed against God. And then all the angels rejoiced and praised God and asked him not to destroy Adam this time for his having sought to enter the garden, but to bear with him until the fulfillment of the promise and to help him in this world until he was free from Satan's hand. 
No, okay, wait, 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 wait. I got to jump in. So this is basically – tell me if I'm right or wrong on this. So it sounds like Adam and Eve were ultimately created for the purpose of redeeming these fallen sons of God from the Luciferian Rebellion Angel Wars that we were all part of, our, our, you know. And, but but it, what you just read sounds suspiciously like the scripture in the Bible that says – until the fullness of the Gentiles is brought in. Did you also notice that he's talking about here how it, this was a long time ago that this happened, and that this was also a time before Adam and Eve were even created, before they were even put into paradise. So this lets you know that this war in heaven happened a long, long time ago, and that this particular event has such precedent as to be the the reason for where we find ourselves now. Well, listen to this. This is amazing how the mysteries of the Bible just just jump off the page. I'm going to read Romans 11. I'm sorry, yes, Romans 11. 11. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 11, 11, everybody. 11, 11, 11. Hallelujah. Romans 11, 11, and it says, quote, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more... Uh, their fullness, okay? And then it goes into 11, and then this leads into Romans 11.25, where it says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles is brought in. Praise God. So it seems like we're, it seems like this whole thing from... I don't know, like what millions of years ago? What was that 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 quote in your book? It said four hundred and seventy three thousand years ago. What was that that date? Okay, that's talking about the 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 arrival of the Anunnaki here on this particular planet. But talk about that for a little bit because you know I think we got the concept down. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Basically, there was a war in the heavens, the angel wars. We were part of it. Um, and it included, you know, Tiamat being destroyed, the Van Allen belt, belt being created, Mars Mars being destroyed, the outpost. We know uh, from David Flynn work uh, and and the Cydonia, uh, a work that he did on on Mars and Cydonia, that there are pyramids, there are there's all kinds of you got the Phobos. Uh, spaceship entity that they they call it a moon on Mars. You can look that up on uh, the Enterprise mission, the uh, Richard Hoagland work. Uh, there's obviously, uh, you know, you can read Joseph Farrell's book called The Cosmic War, where he does some outstanding work on uh, a war that happened probably hundreds of thousands of, if not millions of years ago. Uh, I don't know the actual dates. And you're saying, so so we get all that. We know that Adam and Eve were ultimately a creation of God for the purpose of our redemption, which it all makes sense. It matches uh, Jeremiah 1.5, it matches all the scriptures that we've been hearing, the fullness of the Gentiles. Praise God. So... Talk to talk to the folks about what's up with the Anunnaki, the four hundred and seventy three thousand years ago. What okay. what happened then? All right. Well, this particular information is based on the Sumerian king list and also the king list as put forth by Mantheo, the Egyptian king list, and also uh, the Barossa's king list. And basically, what I talk about in this story, and we're going to have to take this way back, um, because this event is celebrated as the creation of modern day Earth, or what the Sumerians call Ki. And so we're going to go back to, um, this is from, well, I'll just read it. It says this, the pillars of heaven are stunned at his rebuke. 
He quiets the sea with his power, and by his understanding he shatters Rahab. By his spirit in the heavens were beautiful. His hands forbid the fugitive snake. Now this particular planet is described in Job and other places. It's called Rahab. It's also called Tiamat. And this particular planet was... We're going back to the war in heavens. We're going back to a time when Lucifer has already, him and his angels are have already um, been building on some of these solar, on these planets of the solar system. He has reign of one particular planet called Tiamat, which is referenced as the dragon. And this particular planet was judged a long time ago. And it was in uh, Jeremiah where we have a a description of a time before man where the cities of the wilderness are destroyed. And this particular event is celebrated also in the Enuma Elish. And this is also the Babylonian Akkadian on all the other ancient creation stories and epic tales. This is also the story from the Bible because this is where the waters are divided. This is where God said, And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. This is Genesis 1. This is also where he moved the earth. Not only did he move the earth, but he judged Tiamat, and he also allowed Nibiru, which is the planet the fallen angels were inhabiting at this particular time. He allowed this planet to become an interloper and to be captured by this solar system. Is this and tied we, to the Elohim in um, yes, Genesis yes, 1 and let yes, us create them? Would you tie yes, that into? Yes, but I'm not to that point yet because the right, earth hasn't right. even been created yet. So Okay. Let's let's uh let's finish the story first. All right, so you have uh Tiamat, you have Nibiru being captured, and this is cited in the Enuma Elish. This is the event that is being talked about. Um Nibiru is captured by the outer gaseous planets, Saturn, Neptune, the uh Jupiter, and they attract him with their gravitational pull until Nibiru becomes part of this, and then his orbit dissects the inner and the outer planets. So Nibiru actually actually crosses the ecliptic of the inner and the outer planets, exactly where the asteroid belt is. And what happened, as described in the story, is that when Nibiru was captured as this particular interloper planet, it was guided towards the inner planets, and it actually had a confrontation. This confrontation is called the war in heaven. This is the war between the Lord of hosts, which we know as this planet Nibiru, and Tiamat, who is called the dragon, or Rahab. And what happened is um, Nibiru, one of the moons, it's called the west wind, or the satellite of uh, Nibiru. It actually hit Tiamat dead center and split her into two, and shattered her in such a way that the planet became two large pieces and a multitude, a myriad of comets and asteroids, and that is the asteroid belt, and that is all the comets and debris that we see, and that's why there's not a planet located in that particular orbital region, is because it was demolished, it was it was blown to pieces. On the next orbit of Nibiru, around its second orbit as part of this solar system, Nibiru then shifts Tiamat, the carcass of it, and one of the moons of Tiamat called Kingu, which is what our moon is now, shifts it from an orbit outside of Mars to that of being inside of Mars. So now... Mars and Tiamat switch places. Mars, which used to be at the perfect distance to then inha- harbor life and to hold life, 
was already people populated, created, and built up by the fallen ones. They were already doing things across the solar system. Tiamat was destroyed. Mars was judged. Its atmosphere was demolished. Its seas and its uh, its beautiful living expanse, its terraformed um, uh, places, its hospitable uh, living accommodations at that time were completely destroyed. And it talks about this in the um, in the Anunnaki text, and talks about how even the moon had at this point a, a thin atmosphere, and also had lakes and water on it. But even the moon's atmosphere was devastated and demolished at this particular time, and that all of the planets, um, the new Earth, which is called Ki, uh, Tiamat, Mars, and all of the moon. They were all bombarded by all of these asteroids. That's why you have all of them pockmarked, because they all are giving account and being witness to this grand destruction that the Lord allowed to happen long ago in order to create what we have now as the new earth. And it was in this cataclysmic war in heaven that is described by the Enuma Elish that the earth actually was placed at the perfect place to then harbor life and also to, um, to you know, eclipse with the moon and the sun and to have the tidal effects. And, and this is when life became focused on this planet. And so it was after this event happened that long time later that culture and civilization had grown up on Nibiru, and the fallen ones were finding themselves undergoing ecological disaster. They were going through global warming themselves. They had a, a, a hole in their own atmosphere, and they looked for a way to cure it. And in their orbit, they come very close to the sun once and then go very far away from the sun. And so they needed to stabilize their atmosphere in order to be able to collect and hold the heat that they needed to, you know, maintain life on their planet. And so they came up with a way to find gold, crush it, make it, pulverize it into a powder, and then suspend it in this pulverized form into their atmosphere so that it would then protect the atmosphere and also refract the the dangerous waves of the sun. And gold's got a special property in that it can do that, uh, refract the dangerous gamma rays and uh, dangerous waves of you know the sun. Uh, and it's also light enough that it could be suspended if broken up correctly. And so they found that this worked. There was a rebellion on their planet. Um, between There was a division between their kings. One of their kings, Alalu, was an exiled king. He left, and he was the first to make the trip to the earth. And it was his journey to the earth that then brought the Anunnaki here. Because after he landed here, and this is all described in the Lost Book of Inki, after he landed here, he then sent beacons, and he radioed home, according to the text, and told the people on Nibiru that he was on the earth and that he had found gold and that that was the salvation for the planet. And that that's the reason why then the Anunnaki, as you said, 430-some thousand years ago, initially made the trip to come to this particular planet. And they established what was the first kingdom called Eridu, home in the far away. And that's when... Their particular episode, the Elohim and the uh, Genesis 1 and all that, that unfoldment, that all began to happen with the creation of Eridu on this particular planet. And then we go into the story of the primitive worker. And so... So 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 who were these men and women like creatures what what is your estimation of who what, you know when it says let us make them in our own image what, what were these you know neanderthal what were they yeah they were already uh, a natural part of what was nature it was a early prototype 
human, a naturally evolving being um, that, you know, it, it even talks in the text that the Anunnaki said that this could have been their ancestors so very, very long ago. But it wasn't, you know, we know that Adam and Eve were given the breath of life and that they were elevated by Yahweh Elohim. That's a whole other story. We'll get to that as well. But it's important for you to understand that the Anunnaki, when they came here to this planet, they found already a Neanderthal-type, Cro-Magnon-type, early prototype of man. But it was more like a Bigfoot-type creature. Its arms were very long, down to its knees. It had a full body of red hair, uh, could not speak, grunted, ate um, and drank water from the, you know, directly from the lakes and from the rivers, and ate fruits. Did not cook its food. Um, was a very primitive type creature. And the Anunnaki talk about their genetic experiments early on, and also their their bestiality because they also made it with the native creatures here directly. Um, and and so. In their experiments and also their, you know, acts of bestiality, they were able to create what was called a primitive worker. And the reason the Anunnaki wanted to bring forth what this Lulu, or what was called a primitive worker, was so that they could have a creature to mine the gold for them and to also perform menial tasks. And so that was the focus of their genetic experimentations and their um, bestiality initially when they first came to this planet. And it was through that abomination and that abominable behavior that they were then later judged because they brought forth all kinds of abominations. They mistreated the creations that they were bringing up in the um, the house of life or the, in the temple of Bella. It talks about how they had all these beings in cages, and they pretty much treated them like they were living in a zoo, and how they had no rights, that they could be, you know, killed, slaughtered, and sacrificed if the Anunnaki so desired. Well, a lot of people say that the that the uh, Sumerian text indicates that they uh, were the creators of Adam and Eve. Do you have that that Sumerian text uh, handy, which uh, basically talks about the, their surprise of the arrival of civilized man? Yeah, this is really important to understand, because um, it's, it's from the Lost Book of Enki. And in the Lost Book of Enki, it, it talks about how Enki um, mated with these women, um, just these these two women, and it's supposedly that he was the the father of what was called Adapa and Tiamat, Adapa and Tiamat, which are the Sumerian versions of Adam and Eve. Even though they called their initial person Adamu, or the Lulu, the primitive worker, this is a whole different type of being, and I'm going to explain this to you. Okay, so the the Anunnaki, they were trying to create the perfect being to you know to serve them to to teach them menial tasks and to do to do their bidding the lord judged them for their behaviors and that's why he created adam and that's also why he put adam into paradise and protected him from his fall after his fall the Anunnaki no longer focused on their primitive worker, their a little Lulu, but then it talks about in the Sumerian text how they were shocked at the sudden appearance of what in the Sumerian text is labeled and called the civilized man. And how all of a sudden this civilized man appeared on the scene and how knowledgeable and how uh, gifted with ability and with you know even voice and with uh, ability to understand and communicate all this sudden advances that just came about it, it wasn't because of them this is because our father 
Uh, this is the creation of the Yahweh Elohim, the, the Adam that was put in the garden to then till and, and to work, uh, you know, domesticate his sheep and all that. Before Adam and the civilized man, Adam and Eve, their primitive worker could not toil the ground, could not work agriculture and, and, and work the fields. It, it did not have the capacity, did not have the understanding. And it could not domesticate sheep or become a shepherd. It was it was only had the ability to do very menial and meaningless tasks. But after the sudden appearance of the civilized man, and in the text, they are shocked as well. Inky gives him credit for he gives himself credit for the birth of humanity, but we know how that story is played out. And we know that he tempted and, you know, caused the fall of the Lord's highest creatures. And that was uh, why Cain also came into being in the the two different bloodlines. So he does have his seed line, his children, his bloodline, as is talked about in Isaiah chapter 14 and also Ezekiel chapter 28. Because the Lord says in that verse that he will not allow his children to inherit cities and to, big cult- to build cultures and civilizations that he's going to judge him and he's going to have Lucifer, Satan, die the death of a man just like his children and in the sight of kings. And right. so all those are, you know, just further confirmation of the things that we're talking about here. Yeah, amen. So um I found a little quote from your book it says that on quote that on earth a this is that the the Anunnaki talking you know being surprised about civilized man it says by civilized man let Anunnaki and the earthlings become satiated Anu the words heard by the word he was amazed that by life essences or essence one kind to another leads is not unheard of to them words back he sent that on earth a civilized man from the Adamu so quickly appeared, that is unheard of. Right. Wow. Right. That's that's an amazing, that statement says it all. Right there is proof positive that the ancient Sumerian text, from the ancient Sumerian text, that the arrival of, quote, civilized man, e.g., the offspring, Adam and Eve and the offspring thereof, was a total shock to the Sumerians. They were like, where did they come from? Right. Wow. Right, because uh, you know, cause all of a sudden this particular new creature appears on the scene. He's smarter than the Anunnaki themselves. These fallen angels and their hybrid demigod children and their primitive Lulu and all their other abominable hybrid creations uh, that none of them compare in glory and grandeur to this new creature. And wow. so that's when they began their focus on corrupting the seed line of Adam and Eve. Amen. So here's something that has bothered people, everybody I've known that I've talked to, particularly people who don't, you know. I mean, it bothers me even. So life is unfair, you know. So life seems to be unfair. I mean, you know, how come, you know, some people seem to be born in places like Babylon the Great and be given a break and then you have these people who are born in underdeveloped countries and they don't seem like they get any breaks and it just life doesn't seem fair can, can you talk to people I mean it's did someone's role or their behavior during the angel wars have anything to do with how they were incarnated into the flesh? What's up with this aeons of the sphere concept that you discussed in your book? Yes, it is my opinion, just as every day here on this planet, every thought, every act, every deed, everything that we do, everything that we say, is in part manifesting for us the realities that we live. And it's it's always been that way. The Lord gives us free will and allows us to make our choices. And it's those choices which will, in the end, 
when the book of life is opened, it's our own personal choices, our own actions, our own thoughts, and our own deeds that will convict us. It's The Lord will be judged, yes, but it will be everything that we did, said, and acted upon while in the flesh, while in this body, while in this second world age that will be the determining factor for our third world age lives or our return to our first estate. And it was the same for us coming into the flesh and incarnating into the flesh now. And I don't, I can't necessarily tell you exactly how it all unfolds and what circumstances and what, you know, leads to this or that. But all I know is that, yes, our actions, our behaviors, our thoughts, our deeds, everything that we did during the first world age is a consequence and a a, a reason for where we are now and for right. where we find ourselves. Okay, that makes sense because I've never, and most people just don't understand, you know, how come somebody goes through so much misery, but yet, you know, and there's just so many different variables, and it's amazing. For example, you have uh, some of the text here from um, from one of the ancient books. It says, moreover, this is talking about the incarnation of uh, Elias or Elijah into the body of John the Baptist. And it says, moreover, in a place of the soul of the ruler which he was appointed to receive, I found the soul of the prophet Elias in the aeons of the sphere. And I took him thence and took his soul and brought it to the virgin of light, and she gave it over to the receivers, and they brought it to the sphere of the rulers and cast it into the womb of Elizabeth. All right? And then it ultimately ended up into John the Baptizer. Now, and, and, and it's clear when you look at the 66 book canon uh, that there is a number of places that, where Jesus is talking that we, we quoted earlier uh, where this is without question is a mystery in the 66 book canon. So it, it stands to reason that if there's clearly scripture in our existing 66 book canon that indicates that spirits or whatever of folks like Elijah are incarnated into folks like John the Baptizer or John the Baptist, then that there was some sort of intelligence behind that decision to have that happen. And in other words, exactly. our Heavenly Father decided. So wouldn't it stand to reason that, yeah, that obviously that same principle exists as far as who we are when we're incarnated into this earth and what we have to suffer as part of our redemption process, right? Absolutely. That, not only that, let's look at the flip side of the coin. Let's go to the story of Esau. And ah, how, excellent. And how the Lord says that he hates Esau before he was ever born. Why would the Lord say that? Why would he say that he hates this baby, this Malachi. child, this unborn, if he was not an usurper, if he was not a rebellion, if he was not one of those that uh, you know, rebelled against him in the first world age. We can talk about Nimrod, you know, these others, Goliath, the those that incarnated as the hybrid demigods. Those are the true rebellers and usurpers, those that have fallen out of favor in such a way that they have no part in salvation and eternal life. Right, that, Malachi 1, too. I don't want to be on Right, Malachi one two. Yet I love Jacob yeah. and I hated Esau and laid right. mountains and the heritage of waste of the dragons of the wilderness. Isn't it fascinating? The actually the word that's used in the uh, King James is dragons of the wilderness. Wow, wow, that's powerful. Talk to people, what's up with the cup of forgetfulness? This is what we drink when we come into the flesh, and for many. And, and I'm including myself in this, and I'm including you as well. You can shake this cup of forgetfulness in such a way that you reach back to and realize and regain memory of those things that happened in our first world age and our spiritual life. Because we have memory going all the way back to the beginning of pre-existing and being with the Lord and being with him in complete oneness and being with him in oneness with all of the rest of creation. Because 
in essence, initially, in our highest capacity, we are one with God and, and the Creator and the creation. We are one in oneness together in the vast wholeness uh, as the great mystery, as the creation, as the everything. That if you... Because um, you know how energy was never created, how it can never be destroyed. It just always was. And if you can fathom that, if you can understand that, then we do, we have memory that goes all the way back to that. Because we are part of God. We've always been here. We will always be here. Except those that turn their back on the Lord and then are later judged by the Lord because the Lord can, if he so chooses to, eradicate consciousness from existence, which is what he's going to do to the fallen ones and those that side with and serve them. Kenneth has a question for you regarding Psalms 88.12 and the uh, something about the land of forgetfulness. Maybe you know something about that. Go ahead, Kenneth. Hey, Zen, do you think, uh, you think that reference there by the psalmist is in, uh, in specific reference to the cup of forgetfulness? You know, we drink from the cup of forgetfulness and we dwell in the land of forgetfulness during this current uh, season? Yeah, I, I would say absolutely that the apostles uh, and, you know, the rabbis of old, those that were the first followers of Christ and the first believers in the church, that they knew a lot of these concepts and knew a lot of these things and that they were well familiar with, like, the books of Enoch and the Shepherd of Hermas and other books that have been stripped away and hidden and eradicated from us. And, and you know, this... You know, like you had mentioned, the Cathars and other groups of people that have been murdered and eradicated for understanding these concepts, and it's always been that way. History has has eradicated and killed the faithists, those that know the truth of who the Creator is and who His Son is, and and who deserves true worship. Because once you realize that the Father the creator that he is the only god and all the others are just his creatures that he created to worship him to serve in the creation as the then you realize there's no other possibility of having any other religion or any other worship than knowledge and knowingness of who our father the creator is well back there's no your, other way about it back to your whole concept of some of the early church fathers and some of the apostles knew these things. Uh, you talked a, a bit ago about the uh, bestiality that some of these uh, Anunnaki and others participated in and the weird right. traits that were produced. Some of the early bishops, uh, one of the bishops of Caesarea, Cebius, he, he wrote about these freak creatures that were produced, and uh, particularly from Egypt or that area. And, you know, this knowledge was known and it was known by people in the early church. Absolutely. They were dealing with these manifestations on a physical and a direct way. The fallen angels were mating with the daughters of man. They were creating hybrid demigod children. And, I mean, we have the mythology. And even though a lot of people don't want to believe it, there's a reason that mythology exists. Oh, amen. Amen. Yes. Wow. Praise God. Hey, I've got to read this from, this is an excerpt from your book, and I'd like to get you to comment on this after I read this. But people, I just, this is powerful. Um, this is out of the book, Sons of God, out of the draft, the excerpt that I have. Quote, in witnessing Yahweh forth the Son, the Father had hoped that all of the angels would know that it was to his son, Yahushua, Savior, Messiah, it's Jesus, the light of the universe, that he had given dominion over all things and that they should praise him as the exalted one and only begotten of the Creator. We must remember that the plan of glory that is salvation has been carefully prepared for and laid out according to the will of the Father, even before the foundations of the world. This plan has been known to him since even before he brought 
all things into being through His Son, the light of the universe. The plan of salvation would serve as a reward for those whom chose to love and serve Him. That's our Heavenly Father. It would also serve as a condemnation for the archons, the fallen angels, and the humans who would war against the seed of Adam. The loss of bright natures and fall in the flesh would be redeemed by and through the blood of our Creator who, coming into the flesh, would become Savior for all those seeking to escape this world. Powerful. Will you comment on that, Zen? You know, that's the whole reason for what we're doing. It's to help you realize that the Father and the Son, they're the answer. They're the key to all of this. It, it was necessary for all this to happen, all this duality and evil to exist and for us to be here in this place with it in order for us to realize that we can't do it without Him. This is what free will and separation from our Father and our Son leads to. It leads to evil. The free will choices that the angels and humans have made, we have brought up insane kinds of evil into this reality, into this existence. And if we did not have the glory of a benevolent and a just and righteous and omnipotent and totally uh, all-powerful, all-omnipotent God, we would have, the, you know, the the world would be in chaos and disorganized, and it would kill itself. There would be no organization. There would be no harmony. There would be no perfection. There would be no beauty. There would only be violence and evil and chaos and death. And so that's why this world had to come into being. It's just to prove to us that we can't do it alone and that we cannot do it without him. And the fallen angels, that goes for them as well. Wow. Here's another quote from, from the excerpt that I got. It says, The second world age and 7,000 years of duality in which we, as the sons of God, would be given free will to incarnate into the flesh. So, so evidently we actually were given a choice as part of the judgment after the angel wars, we were given the free will to incarnate, drink from the cup of forgetfulness into the flesh, whereby we would be tested in life to learn through the knowledge of good and evil what existence to be like separated from God. Wow. The third creation of Adam, Adam of the dust, came into being as a result of the six-day Adam and Eve's loss of immortality or what some scriptures term as their light vestitures. Can you comment on that? So basically we were given, as sons of God who were involved in these angel wars, we were given a choice, to, and, and that choice allowed us to ultimately become tested in life uh, through the knowledge of good and evil. So, so basically what we're going through right now on earth is a test to see if, Am I understanding this, that we're going through yes. a test to be able to determine if we are worthy to figure out the difference between good and evil when we're in a state of separation from God as opposed to being part of the heavenly office of God. We're in human form. We're fallen. It, can you talk about this? Yes. that That is exactly the redemption process. That's why we are in the flesh now. For whatever it is, whatever it is that we did in our first world age lives, in those spiritual days where we lived as light vestured, bright natured beings, in that angelic first world age, whatever it is we did, we find ourselves now in the flesh going through this redemption process, which means we have been given beautiful opportunity to redeem ourselves through our actions, our choices, our thoughts, our deeds, everything that we do from every moment onwards. Because everything goes out into the world, reflects, and then comes back to us. And if you're doing good, the Lord will bless you. 
and that goodness will go out into the world, will multiply, and will come back to you. And that's the way, you know how they have that movie, Paying It Forward, where goodness continues to multiply itself. And when you do good acts, just for the sake of goodness, just because it feels good, and you help another, and they help somebody else, and they help somebody else, that all of that, that's the way that the Lord works. And, and that's the way that he multiplies goodness. Evil also works in the same way, in that if you are creating crimes or evil and you're um, serving self and you're um, getting, you know, elevating your position, your status, and your wealth at the expense of others, especially if they're orphaned, widowed, or homeless, or, you know, of such degree, the prisoners... Um, if you're doing those kind of things, then you are following the path of Satan because he was also a self-righteous and servant of himself. And there's only those two paths. You either serve self or you serve, as the Lord did, all of humanity and your brotherhood and the sisterhood and the fellowship of man and each other as foot washers, as servants, as kind, uh, you know, you know humble servants unto one another. And if we would all just do that and treat each other the way that we would want ourselves treated or the way that we would want our Lord to treat us, this would be an awesome world. This would be such a beautiful, harmonious, and glorious world. There would be no need, no suffering, no uh, no evil, no experience of it. And that's the kind of world that we're moving on to. That's the return to our first estate. That's the kind of world that I want to be part of and serve in and live for. And and that's where we're heading. And for those that recognize and remember who you are, what all this is is about, um, then you recognize the importance of this moment and every moment from here on out. Because there are no, there's no time to waste. I mean, we have to be productive with every day because that you don't have time to just waste away and squabble away your time. You have to get busy. Things are accelerating, moving so quickly, and we have to be ready yesterday. Oh, yeah, amen. So so basically what you're saying is, and in essence, the, the butterfly effect is, is, is really kind of uh, real in the sense that the Scripture matches up. You've got... The scripture that says, you know, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You've got uh, the scripture that says, that which is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. That is which is bound on earth is bound in heaven. Um, you know, it it, it 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 seems like this whole ripple effect is is not just you know scientific in nature, but it's scriptural in nature, right? Yeah, these we're talking universal law. We're talking the way energy works, Uh, and that's all it is. It's just energetics. It's just the simple, the way even magnetics work. You know, you have uh, positives, uh, and and then you have repulsion where you have um, those that are opposites, where they repulse each other. It's the same principle. Um, You know how the Lord says, if you do good, you attract good. You know, you um, when when you're helping others you'll you'll have your own help there when it's necessary i mean that's just the way that it works it's it's just energy dynamics Kenneth? yeah that comment uh zen made about the the heart of a servant you know um paul told the philippians let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus you know he came and he said i'm the way the truth and the life everybody knows that And then he told us over in John 10.10, Beware the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I came so that you may have life and have it more fully. He wanted to show us the way. He wanted to show us the way to do this because we're separated from God. And the way he did it as Son of Man, capital S-O-N, he did it by abiding in the Father. Now what he wants us to do is to do it by living or abiding completely in him and not in the world. And when we do that, we're restored. We're restored to our fellowship with him. So he did literally show us the way. And, and it's really exciting to hear you talk, Zen, because I'm just 
I'm getting confirmation after confirmation of what the Lord showed me. Yeah, amen. And you know what you you mentioned. You know, talk talk, talk to us a little bit about because this is a big mystery. Can you? What's up with? I mean, we're getting kind of the ancient aliens, but this is all related, right? I mean, we know that yeah. the Second Thessalonians to lie, I God send a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie, is ultimately these fallen angel Anunnaki shape shifting entities. You know. It's all tied into Atlantis and Lemuria and the and the estimation of the pyramids being created over twelve thousand years ago, uh, according to the book Children of the Matrix, which I'm reading. Uh, the sons of Belial were actually in Atlantis that far right. back. Uh, you've got Gobekli Tepe, uh, you know uh, the Belbek. Um, you know, all these ancient civilizations, um, the Vimana. I mean, what, what, which one of the world ages was, was Atlanta and Lemuria part of? And, and were, was it the Anunnaki that, that ultimately built all these pyramids? Is that who, were, what, Sakoto, Kukulkan, all that other stuff comes from? Yes. Yes, and, and as a matter of fact, um, these megalithic structures are not only available on every, you know, most of the continents of the world, but they're already being located and discovered under the world's oceans as well. And right. they're also found and located on the moon and Mars as well, which is verification that we did not create these megalithic structures. And that, yes, they are, in fact, from a time well before the creation of Adam and Eve as aligned to the various constellations and star charts from, you know, 10, 20,000 years ago. And yes, John, the uh, the episode of Lemuria uh, and what we call Murar or Mu and Atlantis or Pangaea, this first culture and civilization, yes, that was part of the first world age because... The Elohim at that time, they were not necessarily um, fully embodied into the flesh. It wasn't until they started to abuse being in the flesh that they got trapped in the flesh. And they're judged as well. They're trapped in the flesh as well. Um, and you had made mention um, about incarnation and reincarnation. Well, here's the thing about reincarnation. Reincarnation only exists for those bloodline royal elite who give themselves to the fallen angels to be possessed over generation and time. That's reincarnation for them, but that's a false reincarnation because they, too, will be judged at some point. Every oh. knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Okay, so 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 right. So basically, when you have the evidence that was uh, not evidence, but testimonial, third party, whatever, um, uh, Christine Fitzgerald, where she comes and publicly states on a recorded tape uh, that the um, you know she and Christine Fitzgerald, for the listeners, for the benefit of the listeners, uh, it was arguably the best friend of um, Princess Diana of the House of Windsor. And um, Princess Diana had told her, and Christine Fitzgerald was a first-hand witness, evidently, that the uh, House of Windsor are, are basically shape-shifting reptilian entities. Um, and uh, and Christine Fitzgerald had basically said that they are, she'd made the comment in kind of her, her terms, she'd said that they are lizard, they are lizard-type entities that they, that they take flesh, and they basically create like um I forget exactly how she but she implied that they that they would kill off the individual and then take and create like um uh, like a flesh but almost like in the movie um what was that movie with uh, uh called Starman you remember that movie with Starman where they where he had taken uh that that extraterrestrial had taken a sample of DNA uh, from the uh, book, from the uh, uh, picture album of the woman, and then ultimately created a flesh body to inhabit. And uh, Christine Fitzgerald's testimony implied that these entities, 
these shape-shifting reptilian entities could take some flesh and create a body, a host body, to inhabit. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, actually, um, it talks about in the Emerald Tablets of Thought how these beings were interdimensional, higher vibrational beings, and how they took on embodiment and form so that they could revel in the lust of the flesh. And it was in their reveling of the lust of the flesh and opening up stargates and interdimensional doorways, oh, one sec, uh, interdimensional doorways that they invited evil in such way that the Lord drowned and destroyed that particular continent. And, and I cover that in my shows. And I'm actually working on another book called The Prior Times, which will be my seventh book after this next one's released. And it's all about that. I'm going to be expounding on all of that so people can understand better. Now, you know, Nibiru is such a major player, and, and it's amazing. As a matter of fact, what I'm seeing out there, there was just recently a, 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 a very nice lady who emailed me just prior to the show was pointing out that Terrell, uh, Terrell 03 or uh, whatever on YouTube, uh, who is actually a very smart fellow, um, albeit, you know, not an not, not a, a understander of Jesus Christ, but nevertheless... Uh, has some associations with some extremely smart uh, astronomers that are following Planet X, and they're referring to it as a heavy mass object or whatnot, uh, HMO. But anyway, Nibiru plays a big role, and what we're seeing now, like never before, is a tremendous amount of disinformation recently surfacing because evidently, uh, people are seeing Planet X. Uh, Kenneth had recently taken a picture of it just driving down the road in Pittsburgh. Uh, it was very obvious to the naked eye. Actually, drove him to pull his car over and take a, uh, you know, non-enhanced regular photograph uh, of it. Um, uh, it. There are people all over the world seeing it with the naked eye, and what we're seeing is now a whole nother secondary set of cover-ups where you have mainstream talk about the entrance of a possible, you know, uh, uh, they're they're mentioning the entrance of a of a type of a planet X like object, or they're mentioning various celestial objects that are on the far far reaches of our solar system. But we know that Planet X slash Nibiru and its associated satellites, the planets that revolve around it, are deep in our solar system right now. Because we're seeing it, we're seeing two moons, we're seeing second suns everywhere, uh, multiple you know sunsets that are occurring on the east and the west at the same time. It's unbelievable. It's everywhere. So what's up? Where does Nibiru fit into the equation right now? I mean, here we are at June the 3rd of 2012. There are some people who are experts, experts at prophecy, Daniel's 70th week. There are prophecies coming out from people who wouldn't know Planet X if it bit them. Then these prophecies that are coming out from these folks are saying that September of 2015 is the acceptable day of the Lord, which, you know, if you take the, the 1,260 days and subtract it from, you know, 2015, pick your date. I don't care. It points to right now. You've got Thomas Horn's Apollyon Rising that identifies at least a half a dozen ancient civilizations that all point to 2012 as the date. What's up with Nibiru? Why are they hiding it from us? How is it playing a role in this whole deal? How do you can you explain that? Yes, and I'm going to cite the ancient texts again. In my studies of uh, all the mythologies of the world, you know, I've read specifically from the Colburn Bible, and I've shared a lot of information from that text because, according to the uh, Colburn Bible, every time there has been you know, a major cataclysm or a judgment from the Lord. And this includes even the deluge uh, of Noah's day, even when um, Moses led the people out on Exodus and the Red and parted the Red Sea. 
These particular events are also associated and tied to the appearance and return of what is called the destroyer in the Colburn text. And the Colburn text, as well as the Bible, we, we know that it, it makes mention of Wormwood. And, and you know, the, the um, Ezra's chapter 2 talks about this horrible star and that. There's several mentions and references to this. But one that I want to make mention of specifically, if you go to Revelation 12, there's that one sign. It's important, this particular sign, because I think this is a sign to the fallen angels that their time is up as well it says and there appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars and she being with child cried travailing in birth and pain to be delivered there appeared another wonder in heaven okay this particular sun now if you study um, the Daniel's timeline the seven, 70 weeks of Daniel and also this thing called the Omega Code put out by Stuart Best this particular sign, if you look up this program called the Solarium, which is a, a program that allows you to look at the moon, the sun, and the stars and their positions in the heaven on any day of the year going into the past and into the future, that on um, September 23rd of 2017, this particular sign shows itself, and this is also happens to be on the Feast of Trumpets. Now, whether this is of significance or not and I do believe that it is now and I'm not you know I'm no date setter I'm no uh, timeline specialist but I do think this particular sign is important in that it's going to be uh, a, a sign to the Antichrist and the New World Order that their gig is up as well but this particular according to the Solarian program that this woman clothed with the sun is the constellation of Virgo and that the moon happens to be directly under her feet. Jupiter, the planet Jupiter, is within her womb, and that the Venus, the moon and the Mars, are they join the nine-star constellation of Leo on this particular date to create a crown of 12 stars. Now, according to the Omega Code, what's important about the 70 weeks of Daniel is if you put this particular on the timeline from when Israel was called forth as a nation in 1947 and you add these 70 years to that that you also fall upon this particular date of 2017 which is significant now whether that's saying that we are somewhere in the timeline of great tribulation whether it happened before 2010 or after or whether you know wherever it is I do think that we are in a significant period of time for the history of humanity and that we are the fig tree generation and that all these things will take place in our lifetime. And so I implore everybody to be ready yesterday and to get right with the Lord, you know, yesterday. And that He is our only answer. He's our only promise. He's our only protection in the times ahead. And it doesn't matter how many firearms you have, how much money you have, how much gold and silver, water, food, whatever it is, how much you have stored away. That if you have if you don't have him, you have nothing. And if you have him, you have everything and you have no worries at all. Oh yeah, amen. Praise Jesus. Kenneth? You want hey, to jump amen. in? Amen. Amen. Yes. Uh keep our sight fixed and focused on Jesus Christ. He's our all in all, like Paul said to the Colossians in 311. I, I just love that verse, and I just have to say, amen, brother, preach it, because it's so important that as we become aware of these things, we understand that our only answer is in Jesus Christ. Amen. So, uh, Zen, do you think that the, um, that the uh, Anunnaki uh, are ultimately going to be arriving here in force in association with the proximity of Nibiru soon? Yes. And you you had talked about how you've come to the understanding of that uh, that the rapture is pre-wrath. It's my opinion, yes, that 
um, a lot that the fallen angels have already been loosed and that they are already here, but that there will be a certain group, uh, especially the four angels released from the river Euphrates and the return of the locust army as described in Joel chapter 2, that this will be the army that wipes out those not written into the book of life and that this will be the army that decimates two-thirds of the world's population and that this will be the judgment, the wrath of God poured out on the wicked. So, wow, yeah, great. I think they're already here, and, I, yeah, I think they're coming in force. And that whole zombie apocalypse is just bare verification, confirmation of that. Okay, so your so your belief then ultimately would be that that the that the uh text uh from the Hopi red and blue star to China um that that the that this that this demonic um uh you know shifting of um I don't know how to put it. You know, you you've got this uh you've got testimonies of people like Brother L. V. Zapata where he's been shown what's gonna happen in the Great Tribulation and that people that there's going to be like some kind of a shift in the I don't know what you want to call it, a dimensional shift, a merging of 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 the what, the fifth dimension into this dimension in such a fashion that I mean, are you do you believe that ultimately this 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 dimensional change will occur that causes people to be able to see these fallen ancient entities, these shape shifting entities for what they are? Do you believe that that'll ultimately happen in the Great Tribulation? I believe it is already happening and that we have been already in a period of time where this kind of Thing has been prevalent in the experience of humanity on this planet. And yes, you're right, John. We are in a place now where the marriage of spirit and earth is taking place, just as it did in Genesis 6 with the sons of God marrying the daughters of man. We are in as in the days of Noah. We are reliving that whole time period and place. Because this is the battleground for the final war. The gig is up. They know it. This is where all the the chess pieces are going to be put on the board. All the cards are going to be put out on the table. Everything is going to come out in this day and age. And we're all going to be privy and to witness to it. Oh, yeah. Amen. As a matter of fact, it's no secret to many that I... I pro now, this is highly disputed. But I personally believe that Revelation 12 uh, is the key to the things that are happening right now. I, I, I have never heard uh, uh, that Revelation 12 was associated with, you know, I've, I've heard many, many, many different things. Many people had suggested that Elenin and that event was uh, tied to Revelation 12. Um, praise God. You know, um, I hadn't heard the rendition that you shared, which is awesome. Praise Jesus. Um, but I believe that Revelation 12 makes it very clear, this is just me, that there's a switch that is flipped, that it, Revelation 12 clearly states that not only, uh, that, that basically the bride is taken up to heaven at almost exactly the same time that the dragon and his angels are cast down to the earth, which would match the Hopi red and blue star Kachina dynamic. It's not to say that there aren't demons and aliens on the earth now. We do know that. But but it says very clearly uh, that the accuser of the brethren in Revelation 12, the accuser of the brethren that accuses, uh, it says, accuser of the brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. Okay? And in that same breath, it also says, uh, that uh, now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to earth, this is verse 13, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, but the woman was given two wings of an eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished at the wedding supper of the Lamb for times, times, and half a time, which just happens to be the length of the Great Tribulation. Praise Jesus. That's why it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath. And then you have in Revelation 6, 17, What's wrath? 
Well, let's look. Revelation 6, 17, it says, For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? And that happens right after the global earthquake, which we're all waiting for right now, the unveiling of the sixth seal, okay, which could potentially happen. That's what the Mayans predicted before their new men of knowledge. The Mayans predicted 4,000 years B.C., give or take, that there, that after a global earthquake, that their new, new men of knowledge would come back to the earth to usher in a global government after the global earthquake. That's what the Mayans wrote in their lore. That sounds very similar to this. Um, a number of things that uh, I've heard uh, from people in the Pentagon that the buzzword in the, in the secret of secrets in the Pentagon is uh, the Sumerian gods are returning. And that's what they're referring to is that whole area uh, uh, that uh, Peter... Wow. Said. Can you repeat that again, just in case anybody missed it? The well, buzzword uh, in... In the Pentagon, in the, you know, the military circles that are in the know about the cover-up here, um, the, they kind of, in, in whispered tones, talk about the return of the Sumerian gods. And they're talking about the uh, what we would call aliens or fallen angels returning uh, into the Middle East, uh, into old Sumer area. The Anunnaki. Well, could be. Under the other ancient names. Do yeah. you think that has anything to do with why we're in a... Wow, praise Jesus. So there you have a Brother Stan Deo, who was uh, you know, in, uh, ha employed by the, the, the government in Black Op, one of the most awesome Jesus-filled, Holy Spirit-filled, his what Holly Deo, praise Jesus for them. Uh, StanDeo.com, uh, insider connectivity or, or insider connections with the folks in the Pentagon. Uh, again, that's a little bit of a did testimony, but nevertheless, what, would you comment on that, Zen? And then we got to wrap up the show with a prayer. Praise Jesus. Yeah, I'm going to comment with just a real quick quote. It says this, and the angels, <clears throat> and the angels changed themselves in their likeness unto the likeness of their mates, the daughters of men filling them with the spirit of darkness which they had mixed for them and with evil. They brought gold and silver and a gift of copper and iron and metal and all kinds of things, and they steered the people who had followed them into great troubles by leading them astray with many deceptions. They, the people, became old without having enjoyment. They died not having found truth and without knowing the God of truth, and thus the whole creation became enslaved forever from the foundation of the world until now. Wow. Kenneth, you have something on neutrinos and, a sh and an actual scientific shift. Will you share that? Kenneth? Can you hear me? Yeah, Yeah, I can hear you. Go, well, yeah, go ahead. They're, they had uh, some findings out of CERN recently. That's the big experiment under Geneva. Uh, they have uh, broken the speed of light. Some Italian physicists. I'm posting a link right now to the chat room. Uh, New York Times picked this up. They're entering the fifth dimension, folks. And what this is, and C.S. Lewis talked about it, when these angels and these these higher level beings are seen and manifested here, they have to slow down. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to bridge the gap right now. It's happening. It's happening. I just posted wow. the link. New York Times talks about it. Wow. And these, go ahead. One more quick comment. This is from the Emerald Tablets in association to what Ken has just said. Far in the past before Atlantis existed, men there were who delved into darkness using dark magic, calling up beings from the great deep below us. Forth came they into this cycle. Formless were they of another vibration, existing unseen by the children of earth men. Only through blood could they have formed being. Only through man could they live in this world. A, when the blood was offered, forth came they to dwell among men. Wow. All right, well, we got to wrap up the show. God bless you, Zen. Um, praise Jesus for you taking the time to join us. Um, this is Brother Zen Garcia. is coming out with a book in November. It's going to be released called Sons of God, Who Are We and Why Are We Here? Praise Jesus. Um, and you can also find him at fallenangels.tv. Again, that's fallenangels.tv. And uh, also he has a YouTube uh, show that's on Wednesday nights and Saturday nights at 
5 p.m. Eastern. That's at YouTube. Uh, I'm sorry, blogtalkradio.com forward slash Fallen Angels TV. Thank you for joining us, Brother Zen. My pleasure, brothers. God bless all of you. God bless you. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you be taught people in a supernatural fashion, that you save them. Save them in Jesus' name from wrath and the horror of the forthcoming Great Tribulation. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Mm-hmm.